your Navy. The ships, the guns, the planes, the men. This is the greatest assembly of sea power that the world has ever seen. 50,000 vessels, 34,000 planes, more than three million fighting men. And we haven't finished yet. Each day, your Navy grows, gains new sinews of steel, becomes more terrible in its striking power. This is your Navy. You ordered it. You built it. Your sons, your husbands, your brothers are the flesh and blood of it. Its Commander-in-Chief and Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Ernest J. King. This picture is in the nature of a report on some of the things your effort and your savings have made possible. Today we hold the initiative. We are on the offensive, able to attack the enemy at places of our own choosing. That we are able to do so is a tribute to every one of you. For your labor and your money have provided the tools that we needed. Yes, today we are on the offensive. These are American troops on the island of Guam, 3,000 miles back on the road to Tokyo. We said we'd come back. Once again, Old Glory flies above the American soil that was in enemy hands for nearly three years. What did it take to put her there? It took a lot of things. It took battleships like the Washington here. This 35,000 ton monster can hurl 10 tons of steel and high explosive 20 miles in one minute of salvo firing. Her secondary and anti-aircraft batteries can pump a continuous curtain into the sky to protect both herself and the carrier she escorts. One down, and another. That's firepower. It took cruisers like the San Francisco, which slugged it out in the dark with a Jap battleship off Lunga Point. Fast and heavily armed, the cruiser is the middleweight of the fleet. And destroyers, cans the sailors call them because of their thin skins. But the can is hard to hit. This new destroyer can log over 35 knots, turn on a dime, and packs a big enough wallop in her torpedo tube to sink anything afloat. Submarines like this one being launched at Manitowoc, Wisconsin. A tribute to the versatility of American shipbuilders. No enemy vessel anywhere is safe from your Navy subs. They have fired their tin fish in the harbors of Japan, sunk more than 750 Jap ships. And the little PTs, the sea wolves which harried the Tokyo Express, prevented supplies from reaching beleaguered Jap garrisons. It took ingenuity, adaptability, and the Navy has demonstrated plenty of each. We couldn't spare enough destroyers to guard our convoys against the U-boats. Here is one answer. The DE, destroyer escort. Lighter than a destroyer, but tough enough to handle any sub. More than 300 DEs were rushed into mass production by the Navy. Watch this one make a death charge attack. She packs a knockout punch. Germany almost won the last war with U-boats. This time, the Axis determined not to miss, produced a U-boat fleet of huge size. Here's another answer, the baby flat top. These converted merchant ships made it impossible for the U-boat to find safety in mid-ocean. They carry their squadrons of deadly Grumman Avengers wherever a submarine can go and launch a patrol which covers hundreds of miles of ocean. Flying artillery. These Avengers are equipped with a forward-firing rocket, which can go in one side of a sub and out the other. Watch this one fire. But a Navy isn't all ships and planes and guns. It's men, too, and they need taking care of. Your Navy is undoubtedly the most lavish in its care of the wounded and ill of all navies of the world. Highly trained corpsmen go in with the first attack wave, carrying life-giving plasma and sulfur drugs. 
The wounded are evacuated with all possible speed to the ships, where well-equipped operating rooms are available. Cutting down the period between injury and treatment has been responsible for the amazingly high rate of recovery from wounds in this war. Each advance base has its own hospital with all the paraphernalia of a hospital at home and the skills of specialists to use it. Their spiritual health is taken care of too. Each ship, each unit has its chaplain. Freedom of worship is one of the things these men are fighting for and they carry their freedoms with them. To advance in the Pacific took a lot of know-how. Routing the Japs out of scores of islands put the emphasis on amphibious warfare. Your Navy learned by experience. Improvise dozens of specialized craft to do the job. Ships with tanks and trucks in their bellies. Tanks that swim. Assault boats that carry the Marines to the beaches. This one carries its own artillery to rip a beachhead apart as it goes in. Yes, rockets again. And watch their terrific destructive power. Know-how is the word for the Seabees, the Navy's construction battalion. Craftsmen and builders all, they land right behind the assault troops and show the enemy what real construction speed is. The airstrip is the important thing. The ships and carriers make the game. The airstrip consolidates it. The CBs are carving this one through solid jungle. Yes, solid mahogany jungle. This is five days after the landing. There are still Japs on the island, but the airstrip must be built. And the CBs are trained to drop their work and pick up a gun, like the old frontiersmen. Here's the strip 21 days after the landing. A thousand yards long and thick enough to take a fully loaded liberator. They're a new branch in an old service and the Navy is proud of them. Yes, it takes a lot of things. For this Navy, this colossus of sea power is a complex, highly integrated engine of destruction. Each unit is designed to play its part in the advance and each must function smoothly. But let's watch a complete naval operation. The recapture of Guam. Here, a task force leaves Island X. Over at Island Y, other units of the fleet assemble and take on supplies for the same assault. These are the big ones, which will smash Jap pillboxes, gun emplacements, ammunition, and fuel dumps. They cost $850 apiece, and one BB can fire hundreds in a day. But every pillbox smashed means American lives saved. Meanwhile, the carriers are standing off Guam, launching flight after flight of dive bombers and Avengers to pound the Jap defenses. Enemy aircraft have been liquidated, and the dive bombers have it their own way. Twelve solid days of this, softening up the island. search out enemy positions. Five more days of this, with the ships creeping closer and closer. Here's teamwork for you, and death for the enemy. Fighting moves inland.
Here's what the Navy bombardment did to Jap defenses. That bombardment cost $50 million. We think it was worth it. But not all the lives could be saved. It cost a lot of American blood. 1,226 dead, 5,765 wounded. Guam is again ours. We said we'd come back. That was one action, one unit of the fleet. For action still to come, we have at our disposal the mightiest fleet that ever sailed the seas. 24 battleships. More than 70 carriers. Four cruisers. Three hundred and seventy six destroyers. Five hundred and eighty seven other warships. and 439 auxiliary vessels and other craft. More than 42,000 amphibious craft. Four thousand planes, and we are still building. Secretary of the Navy, the Honorable James B. Forrestal. What you have seen is your Navy, and you can well be proud of it. It has cost heavily in time, in work, and in money. It will cost a lot more. We have spent already about $70 billion upon our Navy, and we have the authority of Congress to spend $50 billion more if we need it. The power that we now have has taken about four years in the building. It has been a good investment because our material superiority has saved and is saving the lives of many thousands of our men who are paying the real price of this war the men who fight. There is no way of measuring the value of an American life in dollars and cents. But I don't believe that any one of you would withhold the loan of the price of a new motor car, for example, if you thought that it would save the life of a single American. 